Just know that it's good that I know I'm in the screen. <laughs> okay, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, it, this is, um, my name is Lauren Bialystok. I'm acting director of the Center for Ethics. Welcome to those of you in person and those of you online. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker, Dr. Lisa McEwen. Lisa has a PhD in philosophy from the New School and has taught at several different institutions, including TMU and now Sheridan. And today she's going to be giving us a talk called Acknowledging Passionate Utterances. So please join me in welcoming Lisa. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Lauren, for inviting me to talk. Um, it has been over three years since I've given a talk in person. So um, I hope that I remember how. Um, there was some finagling with the technology, but I think it's under control. Um, OK, so my talk is called Acknowledging Passionate Utterances. So this talk forms a part of a larger project based on my dissertation. And the overall problem that I'm interested in is unintentional sexual assaults. So, OK, within the Me Too movement, um, we see on the one hand of the spectrum, one side of the spectrum, the Harvey Weinsteins and the Bill Cosbys. They know what they're doing. They know it's wrong. They don't care. They do it anyway. Um, and that's evident in a lot of the details, but um, not least in the complicated apparatus that they set up around their behavior to avoid accountability. On the other side of the spectrum, there's people like Aziz Ansari. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, in early 2018, an anonymous woman with the pseudonym Grace gave a detailed account of Ansari assaulting her on a date. You can read the full account online, but the gist is just, just that he, she was becoming increasingly anxious and uncomfortable um, while he continued to escalate. And he never denied her accusations, uh, but said that he just had no idea that he was making her uncomfortable. And I think it's plausible and useful to assume that he's telling the truth here. So um, at the same time, reading her account, it's also really hard to understand how he didn't know. And it's exactly this kind of example that I'm interested in. And in fact, the reaction to Ansari um, is interesting to me precisely because it really split the room. Some people thought it was impossible that he didn't know, and others were indignant on his behalf. Um, like, you know, what? Is he supposed to be a mind reader? Um, so quite aside from the fact that, of course, you can assault somebody without intending to, um, there's something moral happening also at the level of communication here. And what I'm interested in is the nature of that moral wrong and if there's anything we can do to prevent it. So first, as a kind of general overview, um, I'm going to look at some script-based interventions, both in public and in academic discourse, including Ray Langdon's critique of pornography. Um, then I'm going to look at some critiques which say that instead, we need, <clears throat> instead of getting rid of bad scripts, we need more sophisticated and dynamic scripts to cover the wider range of possibilities in the context of sex. And then finally, I turn to Cavell on how we analyze in the context of emotionally charged conversations, exchanges that by their nature are unwieldy and unpredictable um, and improvised is maybe a good way of putting it, um, that no amount of fine-grained scripts can help us understand and navigate this kind of exchange. And that um, instead of scripts or formulas or rules, what we need is the Cavellian concept of acknowledgement. And my claim is basically that we need to develop the skills to read indirect communication as well as direct communication. And that involves emotional attunement to context and to body language. Um, and part of being able to do that requires acknowledging the other person's response, even if you don't fully understand it and even if it's not convenient. OK, so I'm going to show a clip, hopefully. There may be some, for some reason, it's not playing in my in my screen, so in the PowerPoint, so I'm just gonna 
change my settings here, but I'm gonna play a clip that I think is a benign version of this kind of situation. It's a clip from uh, the 2005 adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, in which Mr. Collins asks Lizzie after courting her for a bit. The background is just that he's he's kind of a ridiculous man. He's um, He was courting one of the sisters and then he found out that Jane was engaged, so he pivoted to Lizzie, courted her for about a day, and now he's proposing to her, uh, much to her horror. So hopefully we will. As soon as I entered the house, I singled you out as the companion of my future life. <clears throat> but before I am run away with my feelings, perhaps I may state my reasons for marriage. <laughs> Firstly, that it is the duty of a clergyman to set the example of matrimony in his parish. Secondly, that I'm convinced it will add greatly to my happiness. And thirdly, that it is at the urging of my esteemed patroness, Lady Catherine, that I select a wife. My object in coming to Longbourn was to choose such a one from among Mr. Bennett's daughters, for I am to inherit the estate, and such an alliance will surely suit everyone. And now, nothing remains but for me to assure you in the most animated language of the violence of my affection. Mr. Collins! And that no reproach on the subject of fortune will cross my lips once we're married. You are too hasty, sir. You forget that I have given no answer. I must add that Lady Catherine will thoroughly approve when I speak to her of your modesty, economy, and other amiable qualities. Sir, I am honoured by your proposal, but I regret that I must decline it. No, ladies don't seek to seem too easy. Mr. Collins, I am perfectly serious. You could not make me happy, and I'm convinced I'm the last woman in the world who could make you happy. I flatter myself, cousin, that your refusal is merely a natural delicacy. Besides, you should take into account that despite manifold attractions, it's by no means certain that another offer of marriage may ever be made to you. Mr. Collins! So I must conclude that you simply seek to increase my love by suspense. Sir. According to the usual practice of elegant females. Sir. I am not the sort of female to torment a respectable man. Please understand me. I cannot accept you. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can... Let me see if I can navigate back to the pill. This is... Oh, God. Yes. Good. Okay. Oh. oh, no. I'm sure my attention. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. All right. Where am I? All right. So he asks her to marry him. She says no. And he says, you know, oh, I, I think what you're doing isn't really real. You're just playing with me. This is just like the tendency of like young ladies um, to do this. And the, the, the scene itself is much more extended in uh, Jane Austen's novel. And I think there's some point where Lizzie either thinks or she says out loud, like, if you don't understand that I'm serious, I don't know what else I can say to make you understand that I'm serious, right? And so one major philosophical diagnosis of this was Ray Langton's critique of, crit critique of pornography in the 90s, where she basically argues that pornography messes with our social conventions and gives us essentially like a bad translation manual uh, for understanding women. She doesn't, ex she doesn't spell out in massive detail what she thinks pornography does, but one kind of thing you might think is that it tells men that when women say no, they're just being manipulative, they are game playing, um, the way that Mr. Collins thinks Lizzie doesn't really mean it. And so Langton thinks it makes sense to censor pornography, the idea being if we can just get rid of the bad scripts, we can get rid of these bad ideas and clear up these misunderstandings. The problem is we have a lot of bad scripts. And one of my issues with Langton's argument is that it focuses so exclusively on pornography to the, um, to the detriment of, of everything else and ignores the fact that this problem existed long before pornography as we know it, right? Like this is an example in the 19th century. Um, and you can find examples like this everywhere, historically and currently, from myths about sirens who lure men to their deaths with their singing, the Garden of Eden, to Pride and Prejudice, When Harry Met Sally, and so on and so on, and other romantic comedies 
And you see these stereotypes of women either as liars or untrustworthy or being manipulative or just not really knowing what they want. Or you see them as passive as ma and malleable. So a notable example of this is in the much beloved rom-com Love Actually. I don't know, um, I'm assuming most people here are, are familiar with the movie because it is just so ubiquitous, but I don't know if everyone here is familiar with Lindy West's absolutely glorious takedown of the movie. In her uh, review entitled, I just rewatched Love Actually and I'm here to ruin it for all of you. So her main critique is that the women in the film have almost no dialogue. So to quote her, she writes, Colin Firth falls in love with Aurelia at first sight, establishing love actually central moral lesson. The less a woman talks, the more lovable she is. None of, this, none of the women in this fucking movie talk. All of the men in this movie win a woman at the end. This goddamn movie. Colin Firth shows up in France and this woman just gets dropped off at his house and he, quote, falls in love with her even though they cannot communicate, and the only thing he knows about her is that he's really, really into her butt. Colin Firth decides that they should be together without saying even a single word to each other, and so that happens. Congratulations, now you have a weird stranger who lives in your house and fat shames you in Portuguese. Love. This entire movie is just men acting upon women they think they deserve. This entire movie is just men doing things. And speaking of which, who can forget about the Bechdel-Wallace test? First illustrated by Alison Bechdel, which is basically a barometer of the ways women are portrayed in mainstream media. For a film or series of, to pass the test, there needs to be uh, two named women characters who speak to each other about something other than a man at least once during the film. This test is a remarkably low bar, but uh, most films fail. And the upshot is clear. Dominant portrayal of women shows them as supporting characters in men's stories. Okay, so there's a lot of bad scripts, and to get rid of them right now is to get rid of maybe most things. And so that's not really realistic, and I also don't think it solves the deeper problem. So then the next impulse you see is that, okay, maybe okay, there's bad scripts, we can't get rid of all the bad scripts, so what we need is just to add like more better scripts to the mix. And one attempt at this you see in, in campus educational camp campaigns. So the initial 90s slogan was no means no, which unsurprisingly emphasized that when a woman says no, you should default to taking her seriously. And one critique of that is that it places too much responsibility of refusal on women instead of men actively seeking consent. So if a woman doesn't say anything, according to this policy, she hasn't done enough to refuse. Um, power dynamics are also significant here because women often refuse indirectly with phrases like, I'd better get home or maybe another time or even just with body language, right? We don't often use the word no when we're refusing each other in real life. Um, and so there was a shift from no, me, no, no means no to yes means yes, which was a kind of like a parallel attempt to normalize the idea that consent should be actively sought and enthusiastically given, right? And I think most of us are pretty familiar with that trope. Okay. Um, in philosophy, Quill Kukla comes along uh, a few years ago and in a paper called That's What She Said, argues that um, there's there's two sorts of big problems with this general we've been working with up until now. Um, first, that it's just too passive, that it assumes that one person is acting, not both, right? You consent to a legal agreement, you consent to terms and conditions, you consent to a medical procedure, um, but sex is an activity. And so they argue that actually, instead of thinking of it as consent, we should think of it as invitations. So you're initiating a kind of activity. Um, it's the beginning of something. I can agree to go to a party, and then I can just leave the party whenever I want. But second, and more importantly, consent alone can't 
cover the duration of an activity that unfolds over hours, which requires different kinds of communication and in which different kinds of harms can occur. So we need a more complex script to cover the duration. And part of their solution appeals to BDSM culture, introducing, for example, the concept of safe words, um, often deliberately unusual words like uh, pineapple or Helsinki that indicates that somebody wants to exit the situation, right? Um, or the red, yellow, green model, which tells their partner they want to stop or slow down or keep going, respectively. So these are scripts that are allow people to exit other kinds of scripts. And Kublo's suggestion isn't new. Um, Dan Savage has been complaining for decades. Uh, Dan Savage, for those of you who don't know, is a sex and relationship columnist. Um, but has been complaining for decades about the ways that straight sex often depends entirely upon implicit scripts for fear um, that explicit negotiation would just kill the mood. And by contrast, he's constantly reminding his listeners that the Norman gay communities is to get really explicit because they don't have the same kinds of scripts to fall back on. Um, and so he thinks the straight community ought to adopt these sorts of explicit sexual negotiations. And okay, so the explicit scripts are better, but there's still a tension here because along with explicit scripts, um, Kupla says something to the effect of like, you know, obviously at the same time, you need to be kind of tuned into your partner's um, emotions, but then moves on as though that's the kind of obvious afterthought. And the central idea is that if we can just make language clearer, if we can just make the scripts more nuanced, if we can just have more sophistication and details and options, then these mistakes wouldn't happen. And they might happen less, but no script, no matter how nuanced, will tell us precisely what somebody's words are doing in a context, right? No script is gonna tell you how to read the script. And take questions, right? Like this is, this is not um, something that happens in special contexts. We do this all the time. So if you ask me a question, what you're doing with your words isn't obvious unless I'm also reading the context because there isn't just one convention we have around questions. So sometimes they're just straightforward requests for information. But sometimes there, there's something like a suggestion in disguise. So if your partner says to you, should we take the highway instead of the back roads? Um, they might be saying, I think we should take the highway. And second of all, while some speech is scripted, conversational speech is improvised. And even more importantly, right, it's the nature of oppressed groups to, to communicate indirectly. So women often um, demur or pretend things are fine or ignore things um, because they're worried about everything from violence to resentment to any just kind of social unease. So how do we read this indirect language uh, when a lot of what we're doing with language is implicit, we need more tools. Um, in our bag, we need good judgment. And I mean, sort of understandable why philosophers focus so much on scripts because uh, they're really easy to analyze absent of context. Um, but one philosopher who actually makes an attempt to focus instead on these improvised conversations is Stanley Cavell because he thinks Sure, they're more unpredictable, but we, that doesn't mean we can't do the work of figuring them out. And so specifically, he focuses on, oh, I forgot to, he talks about something he calls a passionate utterance. And he's a little bit vague about what he means by this. Um, but basically, he's focusing on the kinds of provocative statements or questions that are trying to get a rise out of somebody or a reaction of some kind, or making some kind of attempt to get on the same page after there's been a fight or a misunderstanding, um, or sometimes starts a fight or a misunderstanding. And um, I'm gonna give a few examples. He gives like 12, but I'm just gonna, I just tried to select four. So I'm bored is at the top of his list. Which is interesting because it looks that looks like a really sort of simple descriptive statement, um, but I think uh, anyone who's been in a relationship might know that if that's uttered, if you're saying that to somebody, 
usually you're not just describing uh, something neutral. You're saying it in frustration, um, probably because you wish the person you're with had already noticed that you're bored and you want them to do something about it. Okay, monster, felon, deceiver from the opera Don Giovanni. A lot of Cavell's examples are from opera. So, um, opera and Jane Austen. I'm less familiar with the opera examples, but anyway. So, name will elicit a reaction most of the time. Uh, to Carmen, Carmen, I love you. Again, saying I love you to somebody, usually it's not just a simple statement. You're, we're looking for kind of reaction or reciprocation. And then more generically, uh, he, he formulates a kind of generic version of this, like I wouldn't want to anger you, I wouldn't want to confuse you, I wouldn't want to alarm you, et cetera, et cetera. The kinds of things we say to each other in order to feel out how the other person is feeling. And all of these, it seems to me, are calls for acknowledgement, which requires some basic level of mutual understanding. And all of his examples seem to be initiating a kind of reckoning, saying in one way or another, you are not seeing me. Is that? Is that? Yeah. Okay. Go great. Okay. Um, saying to somebody like, you're not seeing me, or you're not taking responsibility for what you're saying, or you're not really like taking responsibility for what's really going on here. Okay. So, it might be easier if communication just always happened on this explicit level but that's just not how it works. And it, in a way, it's not surprising that a lot of Cavell's examples come from theater, opera, literature, um, because that's what narrative forms ask us to do. Um, they ask our readers to work harder to interpret not just what's explicit, but also what's implicit. And one of his more detailed, exa detailed examples uh, is right after Don Jose declares his love for Carmen, uh, and she turns and says something to the effect of, no, you don't. And Cavell's take on this, he writes, quote, every critic I have read on the subject takes Carmen at that moment of refusal to be further seducing Don Jose, ridiculing his sense of honor and enticing him to come with her simo, triple piano. She is at that moment, as I perceive her paradoxically and as far as humanly possible, others with no expression a pure constative, the simplest of truths, that he does not love her. She stares blankly at the truth and is bewildered. So, I don't know this opera. I don't know if he's right, but he is presenting an alternative to understanding her as radically different from the traditional model. And it's an example of someone seeing a refusal where others see an invitation. And I think his, inter his interpretation to me anyway, seems more interesting precisely because it pivots from this traditional stereotype of Carmen. And also because it draws really interestingly, I think on the stage directions, which are implying something important about the emotional tone of the exchange. Okay. Oh yeah. So in order to read these situations, we have to do more interpretive work, um, reading people's words in conjunction with their body language. And often there's more than one interpretation of what somebody's words could be doing at any given time. And unlike in literary examples, in personal exchanges where we are implicated, we're motivated by things like insecurity or anxiety of some kind, and we're anxious to figure out what's going on. And I think this is part of what makes us bad interpreters in these contexts, because the stakes are charged and we feel like our, our egos are on the line and we feel especially vulnerable and it can cloud our ability to see the other person. And I think there's a kind of, I think it partly comes from this, but like there's a kind of skeptical or pessimistic impulse that if people aren't using explicit language and we can't read their minds, then like what can really be expected of us? 
and acknowledging uh, another essay. And he begins by citing a skeptic who thinks it's saying, I know that you are in pain is an incoherent statement because he can't really know someone else's pain because he can't access their experience from the inside. And um, Cavell thinks that's worth taking seriously. And I think it's worth taking seriously, not least because it comes up also in the context of the Me Too movement. Um, so for example, it was articulated by Barry Weiss of the New York Times, who criticized Grace for simply wanting Ansari, Ansari to read her mind, implying that anything short of that kind of telepathy absolves him of his transgressions. So in the essay, Cavell dives into a complicated thought experiment that I'm not gonna torture us with here. Um, the upshot for Cavell is that any kind of immediate knowledge of somebody else's experience isn't actually going to close this skeptic is worried about. When you're in pain and when you express that, what happens is that makes a claim upon me, an ethical claim to respond and to respond with sympathy, not because I need to know what your pain is, but because I see that you're in pain and I care. And being able to respond appropriately actually doesn't have very much to do at all with being inside somebody's experience, which um, instead of Cavell's example, the example I tend to use in this context that I think occurs to me as I'm reading Cavell's essay, I'm pretty sure it's relevant. Um, when my father died, I got a lot of different reactions from people and one kind of reaction came from the subset of my friends who had also lost a parent kind of young. And, you know, when you experience loss like this, people kind of, who have also experienced something similar kind of come out of the woodwork. And one kind of thing they would say to me is, I know what you're going through. And there's actually, I think, two different kinds of ways you can say this to somebody. One is comforting and one is not. So the frustrating version is when someone is trying too hard to comfort you because your pain, I don't know, makes them uncomfortable or because they just really want you to feel less alone or because they share the experience and they kind of just assume that because they know exactly what's going on, um, that, that that alone is gonna make me feel better. And that actually doesn't feel good because it's trying to map their experience directly onto mine in a way that is um, stifling. The more productive of this is version of this is when someone who goes through it also says, I know what you're going through in a way that isn't about them trying to equate their experience with mine, but in which they're recognizing that like I'm going through something, they know that it's like a big deal and uh, they care about it and they're not trying to fix it or make it go away just because it's hard to watch, right? I mean, I think like a lot of the impulses we have are good intentions, but often like when somebody's going through um, something really emotionally difficult, like maybe they get like, a cancer diagnosis or they've lost a loved one or just whatever, um, we just want to do anything to sort of immediately make them feel better, right? Like it's coming from a, like a good place, but it's misguided. Um, and it's actually really difficult to say, I know what you're going through and to offer that kind of comfort in a way that creates space for somebody to just have it. Um, but I think this is like, for me anyway, demonstrates the relevant difference between knowledge and acknowledgement um, because it's not about certainty and it's not about having, having, you know, being inside somebody's head. It's about showing somebody attention and care. And I mean, Cavell also doesn't get really detailed about what acknowledgement is beyond this sense of showing somebody like that it matters. And he says, you know, like somebody else expressing that they're in pain makes a claim upon others. You don't have to rise to that, right? Like you don't necessarily have to feel sympathy, but that that's, what that situation calls for, whether that response happens or not. Um, but I think, and I'm, I'm still trying to get a little clear on this, but I think it's about 
doing our best to see what somebody else's experience is, tuning into both like direct and indirect communication, and trying to see it even if it's not convenient for our, our own agendas or desires, um, and not trying to control it or fix it, right? Like literally just giving a kind of interpretive space to that person's experience um, and, and precisely not trying to manipulate them or provoke some kind of reaction or kind of obfuscate their experience. Um, I mean, this kind of acknowledgement is, is rare, right? Like it's hard. And when we don't get that acknowledgement, we sometimes do try and provoke this reaction we need from others. And when we're in the context, which is I think often what passionate utterances are doing, and when we're in the context of passionate utterances, which are more emotionally charged, then we're in a state that, that makes it hard to achieve that distance, but it doesn't actually mean that we can't. This is the final point I want to make. Right, the mind reading anxiety gets raised in response to these contexts, but there's also something kind of disingenuous about it because we do it all the time. So sometimes we don't notice um, so I automatically understand that your question is a suggestion without really thinking about the any mental computation I'm doing, right? In new social environments, we're often trying to read the room to get a sense of what expectations are. If you're in a job interview, you're in a less powerful position, and it's in your interest to monitor how what you're saying is landing with the committee. So the fact is we're perfectly capable of reading a room. There are just situations where it's more convenient for us to do this, and others where it's less convenient, like whether or not we're conscious of it. So the final example I'm gonna look at, it's an example of alleged bad faith from Sarge, um, where a man and woman are sitting together in a cafe on a first date. And he puts his hand on hers as a gesture of romantic interest. But she ignores his hand and keeps talking. So according to Sarge, this is an example of bad faith because she refuses to acknowledge the choice that he's presented to her. This is how a man, an intelligent man, a philosopher, no less, has interpreted the situation. But I would bet that most women who read this example see something else. They see this, this woman understands exactly what he's trying to initiate and finding herself in an awkward position in which explicitly rejecting him might cause conflict, she does nothing. But her ignoring his hand just is a kind of refusal, even if it's an indirect one. And if we interpret her this way, it's not obvious she's invoking a specific convention so much as she's implying through her behavior that she isn't interested, or she maybe just doesn't know how she feels yet. Right? Like, this is like a first date. I mean, if they're half an hour in, like, just give her a minute. And his gesture of putting his hand on her hand strikes me as a, as a Cavellian passionate utterance. Like, he wants to know where they stand. And he wants a response from her, which she in turn ignores. And his desire for a response is understandable, but he's also assuming he's entitled to it. And her, res her lack of response to him seems morally suspect because it denies him that information. But this is a narrow understanding of the scene, one that reads her, as Bonnie Mann has put it, as a supporting character in his story. Indirect communication, in other words, is not always a bad thing. There is something actually performatively savvy about the woman's strategy because it works on two levels. If he fails to see her indirectness, he still can't escalate because his invitation doesn't gain traction. On the other hand, if he does recognize it, he might see that he's crossed a line and made her uncomfortable or called the question too early. And if he's able to read her indirectness, he probably also has the emotional intelligence to back off. So indirect responses aren't necessarily pathological or cowardly. Often what I'm doing is inviting you to see my indirectness so that our interaction can play out on that level and the trouble is, if the audience doesn't see that on their own, there's no script or way of explaining to somebody that you're being indirect without shifting the discourse to being explicit and direct, which brings with it um, a whole host of other kinds of highly charged emotional landscapes and consequences. Okay, 
So I started with the question of Ansari and the nature of the wrong. So let's get back to that. He didn't quote unquote intend to make her uncomfortable, but his ignorance still caused harm. And the fact is we do this interpretive work all the time. And it is, I think, within the scope of what's reasonable reasonable to expect of other romantic partners. All of these men are guilty of a lack of acknowledgement. So how might Sartre have reacted? Well, I mean, or the man in his example, how might that man have reacted? In this case, he might pick up on her indirect communication. He might realize that he's potentially, she's potentially not interested, or maybe that she just needs more time. He could remove his hand and back off and actually maybe just ask her some questions about herself and try and get to know her. He might wait for her to initiate something instead. And if she doesn't, then he might try and ask directly what her feelings are in a way that gives her an easy out. And I think this example parallels the Ansari case. Ansari isn't guilty of malicious intent, but he's still guilty of a failure of acknowledgement. And while both Weinstein and Azari assaulted people, there's a moral difference between these two kinds of perpetrators. And it's a significant difference because the people in the Ansari category, I think, are capable uh, of moral edification, or at least more capable, or easily capable. I don't deny that we have many and varied terrible scripts about women, but I also think it's dangerous to lay too much of the blame there because there's only so far any script can get us. If you think about Mr. Collins, Austin's criticism, criticism of him is precisely that he's interpreting in this ham-fisted way, right? Like Austin's implicitly criticizing this character in the way that she's presenting him, right? That, that he would fail to see Lizzie who is so incredibly upset and just instead be like, no, 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 I've got these ideas about ladies and I'm just gonna like decide that that's what's happening here. Um, no matter how much she protests, she can't get him to understand that she's serious because he still insists it's part of the game. No script will get him out of the bad script he's in. So we have ethical responsibilities when it comes to communication, and we have a responsibility to read the room, especially when it comes to sex, because the stakes are so high. The end.